Hi, I'm Jim Cunningham. Today, we're going to talk about independent trustee. What is it? And should you have one? So really interesting question. This comes up quite a bit. So we're doing this video for two reasons. One is to, to educate you. And if you're watching this live, thanks for being with us. If you're watching this on YouTube, thanks for checking this out on YouTube. And if you're watching this because someone in our firm or another lawyer, which happens quite a bit, uh, suggested you watch this video, please pay attention because very important content here. And we're going to talk about it in a way that I don't think is talked about enough. So lawyers use this tool of, of independent trustee for different reasons. If you're coming at this, not as a lawyer or a CPA, but as an individual thinking about naming a trustee, you might be thinking, well, gee, do I really want to name my kids or one of my children? Or do I really want to name my sister or my brother or my friend as trustee? Maybe I should name somebody independent. And there are a lot of reasons why you might want to do that and might not want to do that. But really, um, should you use a trustee that is not a family member? Now, there's some legal reasons to use a trustee who's not a family member, but also there's some practical reasons, right? So you may have, have experienced this in your own uh, life where maybe there were co-trustees and they argued and things just didn't get done and you ended up in court and litigation because these two people simply just couldn't get along. So, because Johnny got the red bicycle in 1962 for Christmas, he's still mad and he's gonna take it out on, on, uh, you, know, on you, the co-trustee, right? Do you want a reliable trustee with accountability and financial oversight? So very, again, very important. Sometimes people are great people, but they're not necessarily great trustees. So very nice. They might be someone to do help make healthcare decisions for you or decide where you should live if you can't make those decisions for yourself. But again, that may not be the best person for, uh, for the dollars, right? The, the money. And then we're going to talk about sort of the, the basics of trust within the context of a trustee. And uh, how an independent trust company and Aaron Kennedy is joining us here from Premier Trust. How 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 we work as lawyers, and not just our firm, but how lawyers work with these independent trustees at trust companies uh, to help clients. And then we're going to go over the types of trusts that Premier covers. And I would say Aaron, a lot of, and I'll let you talk here in a minute. I I, I promise. But a lot of these, um, a lot of the trusts that Premier handles, other trust companies handle. So you're, mm -hmm. there are uh, several trust companies out there, and we happen to use Premier a lot because, frankly, we have familiarity and they do a good job. And but we're going to cover the types of trusts that that Premier um, has helped our clients with. Mm -hmm. And then we'll also we're not going to talk about healthcare decision making. So if you're looking at this saying. I need an independent trustee to make healthcare decisions for me. We cover that in other materials. We are not talking about healthcare. We're talking about uh, essentially taking care of the money. So if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you're watching this live, please check us out on YouTube and go ahead and and uh, give us a little thumbs up and make sure to subscribe because when you subscribe, it pops up in your feed. I'm Jim Cunningham. I'm a partner at Cunningham Legal. I've been a lawyer for 30 years. We have offices throughout the state of California. I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, trust and probate law, a real estate broker, securities and insurance licensed, and a pilot single engine land of about 1,200 hours in a Cherokee 6. So single engine flying over the mountains at about 1,200 hours. You're like, yeah, maybe I should get two engines or take Southwest. Well, that was me. So we've got a lot of lawyers in our firm dedicated to all things, uh, creating wealth, preserving wealth, uh, the peaceful transfer of wealth, if you will, or the efficient transfer of wealth from one generation to another. So that another, so that covers trusts, estates, uh, real estate. Quite frankly, we have a lot of clients with real estate portfolios, and we help them within that context. So again, I'm a lawyer. I'm talking. When I use the term "you," there's no attorney-client relationship attaching. This is information only. If you are represented by a lawyer, this is not a solicitation for you to be a client of our firm. If you'd like to reach out to us, feel free to reach out. Uh, but again, don't just watch this video and then go out and do a bunch of stuff on your own. Uh, you know, using the latest AI iteration or or just doing it old school, like looking at books and, and writing stuff. And these are our offices in Northern and Southern California. So let's begin is how do trusts, how does a trust work? What What's going on here? Well, the analogy we use is a trust is a bucket and it's a bucket with a handle. Put your assets into the bucket. The trustee is the human being with the heartbeat. There's always a human behind here. So when we name a trust company, there is a trust officer, which is, uh, you know, a person designated at Premier Trust, who is the human who's uh, signing the papers and, and taking the action, uh, acting on behalf of, of this company. But there's a human being involved. So when the trustee stops being trustee, now typically if this is your living trust, this might be you. So you're the you're the trustee while you're uh, alive and healthy and willing to do it. 
But when you stop being trustee, that bucket passes to the successor trustee. So it's very important to understand when we use the term trustee, we're going to distinguish that between successor trustee. So a successor trustee is somebody who is not currently serving as trustee, but is named to serve when the current trustee stops serving. So tr you're a trustee, your successor trustee, once you stop being trustee, your successor trustee takes on the title of trustee and they drop the successor. So when lawyers and trust officers look at documents and we talk about successor trustee, that is not necessarily, that is not the person who is currently acting as trustee. The idea is this passes, uh, these assets pass outside of probate court, which is a lot harder than it sounds because a lot of times, frankly, trusts do end up in probate court uh, if things don't go well or people don't pay enough attention to it. And sometimes if you don't have an independent trustee, and we're going to talk about that, the use case for an independent trustee and why it makes sense, uh, why it might make sense to have this included in your living trust or another type of trust. So why do people use trusts? Again, a little bit of review for those of you who have trust. People do it as a will substitute. It's to keep you out of probate. Sometimes they're used for tax planning, um, for estate tax planning and generation skipping tax planning. And they're used for asset protection, not for you, the person who creates a living trust, but the, the legacy that you leave your loved ones can be designed in a way to be protected from future ex-sons-in-law and future ex-daughters-in-law. Just get your head around that. It means your kids get married, then get divorced. Well, you may not want your inheritance going to your future ex-son-in-law or future ex-daughter-in-law. Although I did have one case where the client said, well, I like my daughter-in-law more than I like my son. So, uh, but that may be you, probably isn't. So again, trusts are useful to avoid probate, protect your legacy, minimize taxes, and they're a vehicle for um, managing your assets during incapacity, which is something that really I don't think is talked about enough. But they're they're at the at the baseline core of most people's estate plan, certainly in California and in other states. And really, what this does is it provides you peace of mind. Now there are a lot of different types of trusts. So if you're listening to this and you don't see the the um, slide we have up. There are lots of different types of trust. A revocable trust is one kind, but you have irrevocable trusts. You have um, spousal lifetime access trusts. We, there's a lot of these trusts that we've covered in other webinars, but understand that some of these trusts and a lot of these trusts, quite frankly, is premier trust or a trust company would serve as trustee or successor trustee of many of these trusts. So just understand we're talking about the whole broad spectrum of trusts. So on a very high level, understand that, uh, and again, we cover this in other other webinars, trustee, what's the difference between a trustee and a beneficiary? The trustee is the person in charge. Trustees have duties, beneficiaries have rights. Trustees are the adults, beneficiaries are the children. So you can think about this, they're like the babies, right? Uh, what would you rather have, duties or rights? I would rather have rights, okay? Because uh, duties are kind of, adulting's hard, right? Being a trustee is hard, it's not easy. Trustees have to do a bunch of stuff, and the beneficiaries just sit back and complain and they might say, thank you. Aaron, I think you probably, you're familiar with this. Oh, yeah. Trustees can be complete jerks, yep. right? I mean, <laughs> trustees cannot be complete jerks. Beneficiaries can be complete jerks, but trustees have to maintain the professionalism, be the adult in the room. And just because, and it's very important to understand, just because a beneficiary files a court action involving the trust, typically in probate court, Mm -hmm. That does not mean that that's a trust contest. So if you say this beneficiary, I know they're going to be a real problem. And, you know, my son's a jerk. I really, and I want to name my daughter as successor trustee, but I know he's going to end up suing her. You may want to think twice about that, right? Mm -hmm. Because if, you know, that could be really hard on your daughter and, you know, could it could be flipped. It could be your, your daughter who's the jerk, but understand that, that beneficiaries have rights. Trustees have duties. So what is a trustee? You have two choices, a non-professional or a professional. Now, a non-professional trustee is going to be a kid. A lot of times it's the oldest, oldest to the youngest. Well, I'll name Johnny. He's the oldest. If you have a blended family, what does that mean? It's a little bit like the Brady Bunch, right? His kids, her kids, one spouse's children, the other spouse's children. Who do you pick? Do you pick a representative from each side of the family? These people may not even know each other, right? I don't know if that would work out. I mean, these are these are case by case uh, uh, analysis. A friend or other non child, and uh, naming a friend, I would just as a best practice, you might ask that person before you name them because no one is required to serve as trustee. Those are what we call non professional trustees. And Aaron, uh, you've been sitting here listening to me yammer on for the last ten minutes. 
10 whole minutes. <laughs> when are you going to take a breath, Jim? Talk about a professional trustee. What is the difference between, I think we all know lawyers and CPAs, but maybe talk a little bit about the choices if you're not picking a family member or a friend. Sure. If you're not pick, picking a family member or a friend, um, then you have a handful of choices, obviously, a lawyer or CPA, you know, among the choices, also a bank trust company or an independent trust company like Premier, where we don't manage the assets and we really function in that one administrative capacity. And that's on behalf of the trust and the beneficiaries. Yeah. So what what you're what you're saying, Aaron, is there are trust banks and there, um, you know, there's Wells Fargo Trust Company and yep. um, U.S. Trust and some other trust companies or trust banks out there. So mm -hmm. there's trust bank and trust company. Trust bank is the Wells Fargo Trust Company is the premier. Yep. And I'm not dissing one or the other, but you need to understand as a consumer is that if you name Wells Fargo as your successor trustee or U.S. Trust or any one of these trust banks, these are what are called custodial institutions, meaning they take those assets and they deposit them at their institution. So if you have your own independent financial advisor or you've got your, you know, your Merrill person, right? And Merrill is attached to Bank of America, which is attached to U.S. Trust. Mm -hmm. If you have your Merrill advisor and you name um, Wells Fargo as your successor trustee, they're going to immediately, once, once Wells Fargo becomes trustee, they're going to fire that Merrill advisor and they're going to move all those assets over to Wells Fargo Bank. And the same is true if you've got a U.S. trust. If you've got a Morgan Stanley account, they're gonna they're gonna take those assets from Morgan Stanley and put them at U.S. trust. That is not what trust companies do. So a trust company is what they call non custodial. And can you explain a little bit of of how that works? Maybe the example: a client has a, a Merrill Lynch account, and they name Premier as successor trustee. What what happens? What happens is we would take over as a trustee when necessary, but that Merrill advisor would end up still managing those assets. Um, you know, we we ask for statements, we ask obviously for oversight, but outside of that, that individual that you trusted when you were alive and you want to manage your assets when you're gone would still maintain that account. Yeah, and that's really important to understand because a lot of times these, uh, no, not always, okay? And some, by the way, sometimes when one spouse dies, the surviving spouse says, I never liked that advisor anyway, and I want to move, which happens way more than you think it might happen. But assuming that's not the case, many times, certainly the larger the account, um, the the financial advisors oftentimes have a pretty, uh, I would say a pretty robust relationship with some of their clients. Certainly the larger uh, the the assets under management or, or the larger the portfolio, you know, a lot of times these people have been friends with with their clients for decades. And so it can make sense to preserve that relationship if it makes sense. So it's not just automatic knee jerk, uh, but just understand if you name that trust bank. So if you, if you have named, uh, by the way, I would look at your, if you're watching this, look at your living trust mm -hmm. and look at who the successor trustees are, because a lot of times lawyers We'll just, we'll say, okay, we'll have the oldest child and the middle child and the youngest child, but if none of them can do it, then there's going to be uh, Wells Fargo in there, okay? And I'm, I'm not picking on Wells Fargo. It just leaps to my mind because I happen to be in Northern California where Wells Fargo started. Mm -hmm. So um, just pay attention to that because if you end up at that last trustee, um, then that may be disruptive uh, with, with, your, uh, with your estate plan. So- <laughs> Why is choosing your successor trustee important? Okay. This is a really, really important decision because something to understand your trust as written, the trustee must follow the terms of the trust as written. The trustee has what is called a fiduciary duty, which is the highest duty under law. It means that the trustee has to put the interests of the beneficiaries and the trust itself before the trustee, right? And so when you have a of trust bank who's taking custody of assets that that can get a little muddy, right? Mm -hmm. That can get a little a little fuzzy. Um, and I'm just saying this in 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 the practical sense. It's not that people are necessarily doing a bad job, but it's it's really you know are are they really acting in the best interest of the trust and the beneficiaries? Um, and then the trustee has to follow the terms of the trust. So, and there are some things that a trustee has to do that are not contained in the trust. So this is really, really important. So if you say, gee, this is really easy. All the trustee do is has to follow the, 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 the way the trust is written. There are a lot of other things that a trustee has to do under law. Now, whether it's California or Nevada or Wyoming or South Dakota or New York or Florida, there is a whole other body of law that goes with the trust. So 
The trustee has to follow the terms of the trust. The trustee also has duties or things that the trustee must do that may not necessarily be written in the trust. Okay, so it's very important if you're a successor trustee, get legal counsel, make sure you're not stepping in it, which is kind of another reason to name a professional fiduciary because they know they know what they don't know, right? And so when you have an individual, they may not really be paying attention to this. So the trustee is responsible for, for financial oversight of the trust investments. Now, a trustee is 100% liable under most jurisdictions for anything that goes wrong in the trust if there is not a written investment policy statement. So this is where we're going to talk a little bit about directed trusts, which is a new thing in California this year and has been around in Nevada for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. But um, we're, so we're going to cover that in a little bit, but understand that the trustee has a hundred percent personal liability sort of unless otherwise agreed or unless otherwise stated in the terms of the trust. Meaning if you, if you have kids and you know there's going to be conflict with your kids, one of your kids may end up suing one of your other children. I have three kids. They don't always get along. I would not want that to happen. I've named Premier Trust, just full disclosure, I've named Premier Trust as successor trustee in my estate plan, my wife and I, in our estate plan, because I don't want to pit one child against another. I've just seen too much litigation. Um, but understand the trustee and the trust must comply with all the laws and regulations. There's even doctrine, which isn't even a law or case law. It's just stuff that uh, that judges kind of collectively invent, and it's not even written down anywhere, right? It's mm -hmm. just kind of discussed. So, um, how how do you cover? How do you you deal with this, um, Aaron? On on uh, on getting around this liability as the trustee, because it sounds like you guys are taking on a lot a lot of liability based upon what I just said. How, how does this work in the real world with, with a trust company? In the real world example, we would get that investment policy statement. We get monthly statements and we track the assets. You know, we track the investments and that doesn't matter if it's physical investments, you know, marketable securities, or if it's, you know, property, it's really our job to have the oversight over all of it and make sure that the way it's being managed is appropriate and to take action when needed to, uh, to mitigate that is, is really how we handle that personal liability situation. Um, and, and that does take a lot of professional experience and, and a lot of just hands-on knowledge of, gee, I've seen this go wrong before. Um, let's handle it this way. So it doesn't. Yeah. I mean, and, and sort of the sort of classic examples are you might have a closely held business, meaning, you know, it's the family mm -hmm. business and premier might be trustee of the trust that owns the shares of the family business yeah. just to avoid squabbling that under most, um, under a lot of trustees, uh, viewpoint is an over-concentration in a too risky of an asset. So that under normal trust law, you would look to diversify and maybe sell some of that family business. But with this investment policy statement, you can you can get around the risk to the, the fiduciary by saying, listen, the, the person who passed away or set up this trust wanted this asset to be held exactly. by the trustee. And yep. and this is this is our an investment policy statement or memorandum, whatever the form it takes. And that, ser that serves to shield the, the trustee from liability. So this is very important. If you're named as a trustee and you're worried about all that NVIDIA stock that's gone way up that, you know, I, full disclosure, I own NVIDIA, I'm not the whole company, but some stock in it, it's gone up, uh, but that it can be volatile. You might have an over-concentration in that. So whether it's a family-owned business or other marketable securities, it's something really to pay attention to if you are a fiduciary, something that does happen with professional management, but when it's a family member, not necessarily. So why is educating your trustee so important? I know, Aaron, you do continuing education. You guys are always paying attention. By the way, the laws are, we have 50 states, right? And the laws are changing pretty much every year or every six months, a little bit here and there between 50 states. So it's really important for trustees to stay educated. Very important, a trustee has to communicate with the beneficiaries. So under California law and the laws of pretty much, I think, all jurisdictions, the trustee has a duty to communicate to the beneficiaries and say, look, this is what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. Typically there's a duty to account. So it, a, an accounting is a lot like a bank statement that you get every month from your bank. There's a beginning balance there's all the money that came in, all the money that went out and an ending balance. And all those have to kind of add up and, and balance if you will. Um, and that's kind of what an accounting is. It's like a bank statement, but just a more robust version. Uh, again, trustees maintain the highest ethical standards and they have to be mindful and avoid conflicts of interest. And I, I think this is harder in the trust bank concept. So mm -hmm. this is those institutions I mentioned before, because they do have conflicts of interest. If you're Wells Fargo, and I'm not, I'm not picking on Wells Fargo. And if you're watching this and you work for Wells Fargo or, you, you know, don't sue me, don't file a lawsuit. I'm just saying 
when Wells Fargo takes that asset from Merrill and puts it into Wells Fargo funds, there is a potential conflict of interest. And these are two things that are typically waived when you name uh, Wells Fargo or they're waived by the beneficiaries. So there is a little bit of paperwork that happens. Um, and the trustees have to stay uh, current with the law. And again, it's always changing and the best practices of trust administration and handling the trust business. So again, this changes over time, it morphs. Mm -hmm. So what is a corporate or independent trustee? I'm gonna start by saying what isn't an independent trustee. And this is found in Internal Revenue Code section 671, 672C, that should be a two, not a one. An interested trustee is a non-adverse party. An interested trustee is you. If you're the trustee of your trust, obviously you're interested. It is your spouse. This is interesting if you're living with the grantor. And I guess if you're not living, you're not a 672C person, I don't know. Uh, it's a father, mother issue, which is descendants, brother or sister, an employee of the grantor uh, or a corporation of any employee of a corporation, corporation or any employee of a corporation in which the stock holdings of the grantor, this is like you who create the trust and the trust are significant from the viewpoint of voting control. So if you have control or a subordinate uh, employee of a corporation in which you have, you're an executive. So a little, you know, we don't see that too often, but the idea here is if this is a close family member is what we're talking about. The IRS says you are not an independent trustee and it matters. Uh, an interested trustee is typically limited to making distributions for health, education, maintenance, and support. These are what are called ascertainable standards. So if this is all new to you and your brain is like, wait a minute, I've never heard of this stuff before. What's going on? An independent trustee typically can make distributions for any purpose or not, or make no distribution. So that is very powerful creditor protection right there. So an independent trustee has the ability to make distributions or not. And the problem with an interested trustee with this ascertainable standard of health, education, maintenance, and support, there's an axiom that says, whatever you can get to, your creditors can get to. If you have an interested trustee who is not an independent trustee, I think that weakens the creditor protection, right? And a lot of times people are writing their estate plans in a way to protect from future ex-sons-in-law and future ex-daughters-in-law. It is better to have an independent trustee, okay? So that's what Premier is. They're an independent trustee. A niece or a nephew is an independent trustee. Remember, brother or sister isn't, a niece or nephew is. So very important um, to understand. So- Again, I think we covered this, but do you want to talk about um, what an, a, a corporate or independent trustee is? Sure. So it's it's really exactly that. It's a company that's hired. Um, so it's a third party. And to have oversight over the trust, um, to administer it. And really, the, the highlight of this whole slide, in my opinion, is that it's a fiduciary duty. It's a duty. So it's, it's not, you're not granting a right and you're not granting um, anything beyond it's a duty. So it's, it's our legal responsibility to make sure that we're administering that trust based on the properties within it. So it's going to be oversight based on the document, not based on family relationships. And that is so important when you're looking to maintain your assets and take care of your beneficiaries for the long term. And unfortunately, I think sometimes, well, I know in, in, in my practice, I used to do a lot of litigation. Sometimes it starts out with family members and mm -hmm. then you're in litigation and then you go to mediation which a lot of people don't like mediation because they feel like they're getting beat up on by the mediator. But if you're in the middle of mediation, I promise you, if the mediator's beating up on you, figuratively speaking, the mediator's also beating up on the other side. They're, they're telling you that each of you doesn't have a case. A lot of times these are resolved by through mediation. And then an independent person is appointed because these people simply cannot get along. Yeah. So a lot of times just you end up with an independent trustee anyway, if there's going to be conflict. And I think if I was watching this, I'd be like, okay, Jim, this sounds great, but how much is this going to cost me? What, what's going on here? What, uh, tell me about your fees. How, how do you guys charge for fees? Sure. It really depends on the type of trust. Um, so it can be a set fee, it, you know, if it's going to be a, a certain service, but in the personal trust side, which would really be that successor trustee side that we've talked so much about, it would be based on the asset size. And we structure it as a percent of that, uh, of that asset 
fee that we receive. So it, they can vary, um, but that is really what we look at. So we look at the overall estate, um, excluding real estate. Yeah. So I, and if I go on, on your uh, webpage, it's somewhere mm -hmm. between 35 basis points and 65 basis points, which is 0.35 to 0.65%. Exactly. Yeah. Not even a full 1%. So that's always what I like to say. I feel like that's a little bit different than a financial advisor would be. Yeah. And trust banks, trust banks, these are the big yeah. institutions. I see them charging 2%, 1.5%, 1, 1%. Oh, yeah. So their fees are significantly higher. And then how do you treat real estate? So let's say I've got a a vacation home in uh, um, in Genoa, right? In Nevada. How would you treat, uh, and let's say it's worth a million bucks. What are the fees going to be on that vacation home? The fees are going to be flat based on on the home itself um, and, and the work involved. You know, that always being a caveat, if it's commercial property and we have a property manager and we have to step in more, we're going to look at it a little bit differently than we would a vacation home. But we don't really want to charge based on the value of that home. We want to charge based on what's right. And, and really that comes down to more liquid assets. Yeah. And the way, just, just the sense I'm getting, and I've worked with Premier for over 10 years now, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's kind of like when I, I've been to your office several times in, in, uh, in Las Vegas, I know you're in the Reno office, but I walk in, I feel like I'm going to an accountant accounting firm. It's just, <laughs> there's offices and people and computers. And there's no bank teller. There's no, it, it's, it's just, um, you're, you're essentially adding value by working as a fiduciary and, and charging a fee. That's kind it's almost like an hourly thing, but you guys don't do hourly, but I think there's a correlation there. So yeah. it's not, you're just not charging these, you know, crazy high fees. I mean, I think you're just comically a bargain, honestly, for, for what it is you do. Um, and I know there's one matter we handled where the, the, the trustee fees is a very large estate where three, four, 500,000 a year. And you guys are way, way under that. I mean, just by orders of magnitude, again, it's a very large, a large trust. So um, who is Premier Trust? Tell us what, who, who are you guys? So we are Nevada Turd. We've been in business since 2001. We've always had that same business model where we function only in that administrative capacity. Um, we've never managed assets. We have about 75 professionals on staff, and that includes both offices. Uh, we've got nine here in Reno, and obviously the bulk of us are down in Las Vegas, um, but that's really who we are. So we can function in all of the above capacities. We can be a corporate or a replacement trustee. We can be a successor trustee. And then we also have some Nevada-specific type of trusts, um, which you touched on in the in when you mentioned directed. Yeah. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about directed trust. That's kind of a new thing. And the reason I want to mention it is there's a problem with being a California resident and having a fiduciary role. And we're going to talk about that. A tax problem, right. meaning taxes might go to the state of California. When, or always, whatever when they does. otherwise might not have to. So um, so six, let's talk about successor trustee outright distribution versus continual administration. So to 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 put this into context, trustees are going to perform three, there's like three phases that a trustee can act in. One is you're a trustee while a person is alive. Now, this may be because the person's incapacitated, but it also may be that if it's a domestic asset protection trust, that you have to have a Nevada trustee. So there's one phase and that's kind of an ongoing um, um, phase. The second one is somebody dies, right? Somebody dies, they go, gee, we need to sell the assets. We need to, to um, you know, reduce everything to cash and write checks to the beneficiaries. That's That would be that uh, successor trustee outright distribution. And then continuing administration is holding those assets in trust. And frankly, a lot of the estate plans that we write for our clients are geared toward not just having all of those assets get stuffed into the, the pockets of the beneficiary uh, right after uh, after death. And the reason is, if a person's in the middle of a divorce or heaven forbid a bankruptcy or whatever it is, you may want a level of asset protection to get you through that storm. Or some people say, look, I'm wealthy. My parents, whatever they left me, I don't want that included in my estate. So I want to have you know, I want to have another trust that continues on. So that would be a, that would be like a dynasty trust or generation skipping trust. But maybe kind of talk about the process that you go through on on the death administration versus incapacity and in, in continuing. Sure. So you know, on death administration, we we start out always with having a meeting with the beneficiary, um, the attorney, and and whomever their financial professional is to sit down and and discover the assets. 
and the parties within it. You know, whom whom are they going to be distributed to? What do we really need to do here? Are there homes to be sold? Are there businesses involved? That kind of um, high level conversation. And then we look to liquidate or distribute outright, depending on the situation, what the beneficiary is looking to do, um, you know, what the document states. And then we have the lovely job of coordinating the tax returns at the end of all of this. So um, it does take it does take a while. People are always very surprised at how long a death administration takes. Um, it can be three, six, nine, twelve, and we have years sometimes where assets haven't been able to be sold or parties haven't been able to be accessed. And um, and that's really what we do with death administration. Um, with continual, like you mentioned, we can step in at incapacity. We can also step in when the existing grantor no longer really wants to serve. You know, What if they wanna go travel? I had somebody call me and ask, I wanna go spend the rest of my life in Mexico at my vacation home. No problem, we can step in and make sure that bills are paid and things are taken care of. Um, you know, and, and you can live the life of your dreams. We also can step in at incapacity should somebody no longer be able to function. But I would say the bulk of our business really comes down to continual administration on those trusts. So distributing, bill paying, you know, making sure healthcare is taken care of, that kind of thing. You know, you mentioned moving to Mexico to retire. Um, mm -hmm. And something, if you're watching this, to to bear in mind, is if you are no longer a resident of the United States and you're a resident of Mexico, that precipitates a whole bunch of issues. The first one out of the gate is under the rules as they're written, you can't have a US brokerage account if you're a non-resident. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things, so people who do not, who choose not to live in the United States, but are US citizens and wanna keep their financial advisor, you have to do something. You're either doing an LLC Mm -hmm. uh, with a, with a domestic manager, or you're doing a trust structure with a, a, an institution like premier, you may also be, you also may live in a foreign country and have assets that you want to have in the United States, having a premier trustee versus just an individual person, frankly, who can steal from you. Yes. Right. And yeah. if, if someone at premier steals, which I've not ever heard that happen, premier is going to make that whole. So it's just, it's just not going to happen because you've got 75 people, um, you know, looking over everyone's shoulder versus a single person. Right. So if you're naming that one individual, less accountability or less ability, if, if somebody goes off the rails, and I, I don't say this in the sense that if you're that you would ever do that, Aaron, it's just people watching this might go, gee, well, what if they, you know, what if they go off the rails? Yeah, well, you, it, it's not going to happen. You're going to be made whole. So understand if you have a child, let's say, oh, my son, he lives in the UK. I want to name him as my successor trustee. Well, when you die, if your son becomes trustee, that is a foreign trust. And the bottom line is it's a flat 40% tax on everything. You do not want to have a foreign trust, period. So if you've got a kid who's not a US resident, um, maybe look at Premier or, or somebody, you know, another type of trust company to do that. Because these are little things that I think, frankly, a lot of estate planning attorneys don't know, mm -hmm. should be told. Certainly the clients don't know. And yeah. it matters where you're uh, where you're residing. Let's talk about directed trust. So this has been around for a long time in Nevada and Wyoming and South Dakota and Alaska and, and these other jurisdictions. California, for some reason, just enacted this. What is a directed trust? So here's where I'm going with this. Some people say, well, gee, if Premier's trustee and I don't have any say, or if Premier's trustee and I'm leaving it for my kids, they don't have any say. It's all like they have to go to Premier to, for, to do anything, right? Well, California, um, and I'm not, this is more of like a, a, a cautionary tale why you would not want to name someone a trust director who's a California resident. And I'll, 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 we'll get there. But a trust director is um, somebody who can direct the trust, the trustee, and tell, basically tell the trustee what to do, right? So it, it directs the trustee on specific fiduciary powers, like it's okay to invest in this risky investment. It's okay to hold crypto. I don't know if you guys hold crypto or not. Do you? We do not. Okay. Yeah, that's one so, of the we can't. Yeah. So probably a bad example. Um, <laughs> but a directed trust is, you know, trustee, conduct yourself in this manner. And typically it has to do with investments where the trustee says, look, I don't want to be responsible for these wacky investments that the trust is investing in. You direct us and you tell us how to, how to invest the proceeds. And a lot of your trusts are directed trust, aren't they, Aaron? Yeah, I'd say probably 50%. Yeah. yeah. So um, it, trustee is directed to retain a family business and ranch in the trust. I can tell you, 
if you own a ranch, you probably know a lot of times it does not make economic sense to own a ranch. It seems like it's a lot of money that goes out. I mean, it's beautiful, right? A mm -hmm. lot of money that goes out. There's typically not enough money coming in to, uh, to cover expenses and, and a trust bank might look at that and say, you know, we're going to sell it because it doesn't make sense to keep it. So a, tr a, a directed trust, the, the trust director can instruct the trustee on what to do with that asset. Now, here is the problem. Um, well, here's why you would have a directed trust. The, what are the alternatives? Co-trustee. Is Premier ever co-trustee? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we okay. can start co-trustee. The problem is you have shared duties and liabilities. You're jointly liable. So Premier's liable for whatever the knucklehead co-trustee might do or might not do. And so you got to have some structure on that. So co-trustee is joint and several liability, meaning if one does something bad, the other one's 100% uh, oh, personally liable right? 100% personal liability. Uh, delegation. So a trustee can delegate authority. So what you've got here is you have a trust and just imagine Premier's trustee. And then the question is, if somebody wants to instruct the trustee on what to do, the trustee could delegate that authority to a third party. But the problem is the trustee's still liable, mm -hmm. right? And so their trustees are really reluctant to do that because they've got to not only select the right person, but then they've got to manage it and there's a lot of oversight. And then they're going to be liable under agency law. So not fiduciary law, but under agency law, you're liable for the acts of your agent. It's no different than being an employer. You're liable for all the knucklehead stuff your employee does during the scope and course of their employment um, at, at your company. A directed trustee kind of rakes off the best uh, in the sense that the trustee really does not have the authority to do those things that the, the trust director has authority over, right? So the trust director says, there's this limited scope of, of you know asset class to hold. The trustee doesn't even have any authority to say yes or no. It's the trust director who just tells the trustee what to do. Professional trustees like that, uh, companies like that, because it really insulates the, the trustee from liability, right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's why people do it. Mm -hmm. So Reduce liability typically on high-risk assets, typically lower professional uh, trustee fees because the more risk, the more headspace, right? The higher the fee, right? Um, and this combines the professionalism or the professional administration of the trust company with the trusted third-party discretion, which is the individual. So again, somebody may be really good at deciding what, uh, just use the ranch example, what needs to go on in the ranch and they can direct the trustee, Hey, we need to, you know, repair this fencing or do this or, or, or buy more water so we can grow more hay to feed the cattle or whatever it is. And, and that's something that somebody uh, uh, on the trust director level can handle. But again, the trust company's handling the bookkeeping, the tax compliance, all that other stuff. And frankly, there's a new, uh, a new law out the corporate transparency act effective January. Well, it's effective now, Mm -hmm. And if you have a smaller company, which is fewer than 20 or 25, I can't remember employees and less than 5 million in revenue. So if you have an LLC that owns a building, you have to report that to the federal government now. And that's something, is that, are you guys handling that as the fiduciary? I'm assuming you would be, right? Yeah, we have been. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's a whole nother, and, and it's a $500 per day penalty. So mm -hmm. here's an insider tip when dealing with California. Here's the problem. California said, yay, we can have trust directors, but if you name, if you have a Nevada trust, and we're going to talk about the advantages of having a Nevada trust, the idea is uh, at, at a minimum, you're deferring California income tax. If you have a California resident trust director, it subjects the trust to income tax, to California income tax. So you need to be very, very careful with who you select as trust directors. And again, a lot of estate planning lawyers don't even don't even know this, right? Because estate planning lawyers really aren't, a lot of times are not focused on income tax. Now at our firm, we happen to be focused on income tax and that's a kind of a, a passion of mine, um, but not all lawyers are paying attention to this. So you have to be really, really careful. You would probably want to choose a non-California resident trust director. And how would, so how would that work? Could Premier also be the trust director and the trustee or how are you guys working with the trust directors in, in the real world? In the real world, generally, no. I mean, usually we're named in the administrative capacity, um, you know, as previously mentioned in the in the other slide. And so the director tends to be somebody who is a third party. It's oftentimes, you know, a relative. Maybe they don't live in California. They live, you know, they've moved to Florida or somewhere right. of that nature. And that's usually what we see. 
a brother, a cousin, a sibling, a, a kid, a niece, a nephew, something even, like even that. Even the next business partner, something like that. Right. You know? Yeah, we get a, we get a lot of people. Oh, it's interesting. A little side point about moving from California to Nevada. If you ever wonder why there's so many ten and twenty million dollar homes in Nevada, it's because California. If you have your ten million dollar home in California, you want to move to Nevada, and you get the million dollar condo. California says, "Wait a minute, that's not your residence. You still have this ten million dollar place. You got to get a more expensive place in Nevada." So that's a. Uh, that's why there's so many expensive homes. That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> Who would need a corporate trustee? Who? What kind of people need a corporate trustee? Let's look at case studies. Let's. I'll let you handle this. I'll let you do some talking, Aaron, because I could talk all day. <laughs> so we'll take Linda for example. Uh, Linda's fifty. She owns a medical practice. She's got five million in assets, and really, she's looking to protect it, much like we just talked about directed trusts. Um, Linda's looking to protect that. In Nevada, we do have uh, asset protection laws, which are unusual. And um, that's why we see some of these particular types of case studies come to Nevada. Really, that means that she's looking to protect her wealth. And um, one of the reasons being is we don't allow exemption creditors. So Linda won't run into that problem in the future um, of the you know former son-in-law who decides to to try to sue her um, as long as those assets are in that Nevada Asset Protection Trust for two years. So, so there is a seasoning period. So it's got is. that, that those particular assets have to be in the trust for two years to be protected. Yeah. Um, and this, you know, if you already have the creditor claim has arisen and you're being sued, it's too late. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, or even, even if it's a threat out there. So you yeah. want it when the sky is clear. Yeah, you want to do it when the end, or you can do a carve out for that too. You can say, look, you know, it's going to be protected, but not for this particular uh, cause of action. So this is really, you do need to meet with, you know, the appropriate legal counsel, which may not just be your estate planning lawyer. It could be your business uh, law attorney, meet with your trustee, meet with the CPA, make sure it's, it's a right fit. Uh, but a lot of our clients do domestic asset protection trusts. It's, it's actually a, can be a very, um, powerful strategy to give you peace of mind because of, especially the professionals, lawyers, doctors. Uh, architects, engineers, we have continuing liability for a very long time. Yeah. And certainly if you're a, a, a OBGYN, if if you do something and somebody says you were at fault, they have until they turn 18 plus two years to sue you. So that's a very long time horizon after you've, after you've retired. Um, but the, the steps would be the client's attorney drafts a Nevada Domestic Asset Protection Trust, send the trust out for review, the client premier sign the trust, and then, then assets are transferred. So this before the uh, drafting of the documents, we need to make sure that it's appropriate um, mm -hmm. if, if this is something that that you're interested in. But uh, again, for Linda, a great outcome gives her peace of mind and that she knows she's carved out that that five million or that four million or whatever it is. You can't make yourself impoverished, uh, but but that's protected in case something bad happens. Exactly. And, and then we have James. Um, we see this quite a bit. You know, James is a single dad. He's got a couple of kids. Um, he's got a few million dollars in assets and also owns a home. And he, really and truly, this is exactly what a successor trustee is set up for because James has family, but he doesn't want to burden them because he knows what it is to lose a spouse. And he wants to make sure that his kids are taken care of should something happen to him. And, uh, you know, he wants his mom or, or his, you know, former wife's mom to take care of the, the child. So that's that's really where we can step in um, should anything happen in his life. He then knows he has a parachute. His kids will be okay. You know, they'll receive distributions for the long term and um, the guardian will be taken care of as well. So nobody is burdened as much as they may have been should he not have had a revocable living trust. And this is important, especially for people who are, are not, um, I guess if the family unit so if you have children and you're not living with the children's parent and you're not, that's not part of your family, something to understand is if under California law, at least if a parent is alive, there is no need for a guardianship of the person of the child, meaning they just go to that other child, unless of course they, you know, they don't have custody or something if they've been denied custody for a, you know, a good reason, but the assets, this is a different story with assets. So if you're frankly, if you're divorced and you don't want your ex getting, uh, a hold of that, those assets, you really should think about doing an estate plan because if you don't, odds are that X will likely end up uh, having a really outsized role in the participation on how that money's spent. So they could end up even being the guardian of the estate of that child. So they're the natural first priority 
person to, to be the guardian of the estate. And if they're bad with money, they could just blow all the money, even though they're, they're not supposed to, they could blow it. That's why people set up a living trust. That's why someone would name tr Premier to, to handle the money for the children. So very important if that's you, if you're divorced and you don't want your ex in, in charge, uh, something really to, to think about. And let's, let's talk about Mia. Mia is uh, 30. She doesn't have any close family or, or friends. And so there wouldn't be anybody else um, to handle her estate if anything happened to her. She also is the current beneficiary of a trust that's sitting at a bank. And um, she has a separate relationship with a financial professional that she likes, and she would rather have them manage that money. So she's really looking for two things, which would be that successor trustee role, as well as having those assets transferred over to her existing financial professional. In both cases, we can serve. Um, we can both assist with making sure that she has somebody, should anything happen to her, if she becomes incapacitated or passes away, we can go ahead and take care of those assets for her and just the distribution of them. The other thing is if she wants her financial professional to have those assets and to manage them for her, we can take a look at that trust, the existing one, and say, okay, here's how we could step in, and then you can have them where you want. It, it makes it just easier all around on everybody. Yeah. And if you're a financial advisor watching this and you are independent, mm -hmm. uh, it's very important to understand the difference between a trust bank and a trust company. So if you're with an in independent uh, uh, broker dealer, they may not have a trust company to go to. So this is the big difference between trust banks and trust companies. If you go to a mm -hmm. trust bank, you're going to lose those assets under management. You're going to lose that relationship. If you go to a trust company, broadly speaking, that relationship is um, is, is preserved. So trust bank is big. They're big, they're big institutions. Trust company, uh, is little, I don't even know, but just be as big. Just remember that we're, yeah, we're so big. <laughs> well, I mean, you're big, but you're not multi, no, you're not, you know, we're not multi-state. Yeah. Yeah. Right, we're right, not going right. to take anything. I mean, you're big, you're big enough. Um, yeah. so, uh, personal, we talked revocable, just charitable trust. Um, charitable trust can get kind of complicated. So we're going to cover that, uh, I believe next week, charitable trust, and that's where you um, put some something of value, typically, typically not cash, but and there's a use case for cash, but you put something of value and then sell it in the charitable trust. And that's a tax-free zone, at least until the money comes back to you. And so what that means is if you have a highly appreciated stock portfolio, you can put that into a charitable trust, sell all those stocks. There's no immediate capital gain. And you might take an income stream off, off of that, a minimum 5%, maximum 50% income stream. Most people, depending on age, are taking five, five to seven to eight. Um, these are also very powerful tax deferral strategies to spread out a capital gain. So if you know, if you are selling a, a capital asset and you're a California resident and you know you're not going to be a California resident in the future, it might make sense, depending on what that asset is, to put that in a charitable trust because when those when those payments come out to you, it is possible that you would be avoiding some or all of your California state income tax. So very important to understand that. Um, life insurance trust, life insurance trust, it typically life insurance when it goes to your heirs is not subject to income tax, broadly speaking. If it is in your name, when you die, it is included in your estate. So if you have a $10 million policy of life insurance, it's in your estate, 4 million or a four and a half million dollar tax bill. An irrevocable life insurance trust is a way where premier trust is the trustee of the trust. And uh, the death benefit is not taxable in the estate. So a lot of people do this when, um, you know, for a larger estate to essentially pay the estate taxes or provide the liquidity for the estate tax. So if you have a $50 million estate and you're looking at a $15 million tax bill when you die, it might make sense to have a $15 million life insurance policy to pay the taxes instead of selling assets when somebody dies. And then special needs trust. Tell me, so special needs trust we're going to cover in, in a few weeks. And that's if you have a loved one uh, who is um, with special needs and typically on public assistance benefits. So this is supplemental security income or SSI, not mm -hmm. SSDI, not social security disability income. That's not needs tested, but SSI is. And that's something that you handle special needs trust as well, correct? Yes. Yeah, that is. I mean, we we get a lot of calls um, about now in the world that we live in, um, autistic kids. You know, kids that might live somewhat independent, but need um, some oversight. And that's really what they hire us to do to make sure that they're being taken care of uh, because they might not have close family and, and friends. Right. Um, tell me about the type of Nevada trust that you're that you're seeing. 
Um, you know, we we see a lot of the uh, the standard asset protection trusts, uh, the domestic asset protection trusts. We see quite a few um, decantings. You know, oftentimes if there's a previous irrevocable trust, and they want some of the provisions changed within it, we we do refer out a lot to uh, legal counsel on on decanting. Also, the NINGS, um, those Nevada Incomplete Gift Non Grantor Trusts, which we actually had a lot of until California changed yeah. the laws. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We never did those. I did one for a friend and I told them, California's going to shut this down. Oh, sure yeah. enough, they did. They so did. if you're still dealing with those and now by dealing with, it's trying to figure out how do we, how do we minimize that? What can we do? There's some things you can do if it's outside the scope of what we're talking about here. But if you're stuck with a Ning, uh, you're going to need some help. Let me just put it that way. And and that's where maybe that decanting can come in, come in handy. <laughs> yeah. And the spousal lifetime access trust. So that is a uh, extremely popular. You see that a lot. I think these are going to be heavily scrutinized in 2028. Okay. So because you file your gift tax return in 2026, there's a three, three year statute. I think you're going to see a lot of examinations in 2028. There's a lot of ways you can get those wrong. And we cover that in other materials. So we're going to finish here with why Nevada. So um, Aaron, you're in the Reno area and Premier Trust is in Nevada. Do they have an office in California? We do not. We we no. only have offices in Why? Nevada. Why? It's because of Nevada's laws. I mean, bottom line, um, you know, there's no state income tax here in Nevada, so we're lucky. Uh, <laughs> we also have dynasty planning, so a trust can last 365 years. So it's it's helpful for those generation skipping trusts. There's also the decanting statute and uh, that no exemption creditor law that I mentioned previously. Um, is really one of the biggest things that we see, as well as the directive trust that you mentioned, the division of duties. So you can have separate, you know, administrative trustee, investment trustee, and distribution trustees, um, which you can't you can't do everywhere. And that's really why we did that. At the end of the 90s, the statutes changed, which is right when you saw a bunch of trust companies open up in Nevada. <laughs> yep. It's interesting because I, when I go to compare this with California, one, we have state income tax, the highest state income tax. But if you are a resident of New York City, your taxes are higher when you do state and local. Dynasty planning, we don't have it. Maximum 90 year term for trust compared to 365. Wow. Decanting, we do have uh, a decanting statute, but uh, a very recent. Asset protection, non existent in California. What you know, people say, well, why should I, why can't I just do a California LLC? Why not do a Nevada LLC or a Wyoming LLC? It's because a creditor in California can effectively foreclose on your LLC shares, like a bank forecloses on a property and own those shares and end up owning your LLC or your shares of the LLC. You can't do that in Wyoming. I don't believe you can do that in Nevada either. So it's a it's a big difference. And, you know, it doesn't matter until those creditors start knocking at your door and then you're really sweating it. And if you've been through that before, I know how you feel. We've gone through that with clients before. It's a, it can be extremely stressful. And frankly, you can get held liable for stuff that's not even your fault. Okay. So maybe an employee does something, um, you know, special damages in California. If you get in a car accident and somebody has, has $10 million in medical, future medical bills, if you're 1% liable, you can be held responsible for that $10 million liability. So this is real stuff in California, extremely creditor friendly. Um, we do have division of duties among multiple trustees now with the stat, the recent statute, but it's yeah. not going to help you because if you name a, a trust director that's a California resident, poof, it subjects a Nevada trust mm -hmm. to California state income tax. So that's why it doesn't make sense to name a California trust director. So when to call Premier Trust? At any point in the conversation, really. Yeah. So, you know, anytime you talk to your attorney, anytime you talk to your financial professional, anytime you just have a question, I, I heard that trust companies exist and I just want a little bit more information. You know, that's that's what I always say. We're here to serve clients and educate because not everybody knows we exist until they need us. And then it might be too late. Yeah. And, and I think this is something, this is a big decision. I know for me personally, it was a big decision. And because you're really thinking, I mean, it's big, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we we know we're, we're talking about successor trustee or trustee of a trust. And so it's okay to call them and say, hey, I'm thinking about naming you a successor trustee on my living trust, or I, my lawyer said to do this irrevocable life insurance trust. Um, I would say if you're going to do an irrevocable life insurance trust, I don't even think we 
do those unless there's a professional trustee in the mix, because these get screwed up all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a lot of stuff you have to do year over year. And frankly, it just doesn't get done. And then, then the kind of the whole plan collapses and it's included in your estate. So that brings us to the end of our materials. Our offices are in Northern and Southern California, not too far from Reno. So our Auburn would be the closest. Mm -hmm. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our, our YouTube channel and, uh, and share it. Share it with someone who, who might benefit from this. And um, Corporate Transparency Act. Not sure why this one's in here. Uh, next is using charitable trust to save taxes and make the most of your uh, philanthropy. That is August 29th coming up. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you might've already just watched this video and you're like, wait a minute, it's coming up. But uh, that is coming up. We're going to be doing that uh, with a uh, a charity. So a very important, a lot of different ways to give to charity. So thinking about, you know, you might already be giving to charity. And if you do it in a different way, you might get extra tax benefits. So we'll cover that and we'll open it up for questions. So if you're watching this on YouTube, please just keep watching and magically another video is going to roll. Thank you for joining us.